Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to the veterinarian from the different region in the world. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. You are welcome to Sri Lanka Veterinary Association second international webinar series. We have organized 16 webinars at the second SLV international webinar series. Our resource persons are well reputed veterinarian in Sri Lanka, USA, Australia, UK. And uh, this is our second, this is our uh, seventh webinar. Today our topic is antimicrobial and veterinary practice challenges and opportunities. Our resource person is Dr. Dinetra Subasinha from uh, Department of Clinical Sciences, School, School of Veterinary Medicine, Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences, University of Surrey, UK. And our moderator is Dr. Shani Atapattu. We are proud to have high caliber veterinarian in this webinar series. Uh, without wasting much time, I would like to invite Dr. Susanta Malavarati, the President of Sri Lanka Water Association, to welcome you all. Dear President, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sugat, our former Secretary of Sri Lanka Water Association. Very good uh, afternoon, very good evening, and very good morning to all the participants from uh, different parts of the world. And uh, today is a very important day because you know today is the Environmental Day, World Environmental Day. So I think it is a very uh, matching topic we have selected for the day. And uh, welcome Dr. Dianetra Subhasinga, our speaker today. She is joining from UK and thank you very much for your time and commitment. And today's moderator is Dr. Ushani Atapattur from uh, Australia. Welcome Dr. Ushani and thank you for your time and commitment. And all the members uh, participating here, on behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I welcome you all very warmly to this uh, seminar session. And this uh, seventh uh, session of international uh, seminar series. And we have been conducting this uh, every week. And I am very happy that uh, all of our members, uh, most of our members are joining here and also visiting our uh, YouTube channel and uh, viewing that uh, program. And uh, before we take uh, the presentation on, uh, I, I invite all, all of you to keep your mic uh, muted and support the presenter. And uh, very happy to welcome you, Dr. Dinetra, again. And I hand over uh, to Dr. Ushani Atapattu to introduce our uh, presenter today. How about you, Dr. Ushani? Uh, thank you, Dr. Stanta. Um, well, uh... Well, if I'm going to talk about Dr. Dinezara, there's a uh, huge thing, huge lot of things that I can tell. But um, uh, I will give a very succinct introduction of Dr. Dinetra and my apologies if I drop anything significant during the introduction. Well, like all of us, or many of us, um, she's a graduate from the veterinary uh, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Sciences, University of Peradeniya. And she completed her master's in toxicology man and technology and management at the Institute of uh, Technological Science, Technology in Thailand, where subsequently she came, completed a doctoral degree in biological sciences as a Cambridge Commonwealth Trust Scholar and a New Hope College Cantonary Scholar at the University of Cambridge. She's also a member of uh, the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. During her comprehensive career, she worked as a small animal veterinarian in private clinics and also in charities in addition to a role in academia. She was affiliated as an academic at the University of Colombo as a senior lecturer before returning to England, where she joined uh, uh, the clinical department of the University of Surrey Veterinary School in 2018, and that's where she is based now. She's, she currently undertakes research into teaching and learning in higher education and explores avenues to enhance antimicrobial stewardship in all aspects of veterinary practice, emphasizing on the small and small animal general practice. 
Also, she collaborates with multiple organizations, both in the UK and uh, overseas. Uh, welcome, Dr. Linetra. Uh, we would be looking forward, we all are looking forward to hear what you have to deliver to us. And uh, from the attendees, I would, uh, like Dr. Susanta said, uh, would like to keep your mics muted um, till the end of the presentation. And also, um, if you have questions, you can post them on the chat box or you can um, keep them to the question and answer session that will be um, at the end of the presentation. And Dr. Dinetra, the stage is all yours, the webinar actually. Thank you, Shani and uh, Dr. Susanta. Uh, for that lovely introduction. Um, and what I will first do is I'll try and share my screen, Nushani, if you can let me know if everything looks all right. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, oh. Are you able to see the first slide, Nushani? Yes. Okay. Right, so I'll start uh, by just uh, saying that my experience, like Ushani said, is mainly in small animal practice, but I'm very much interested in all species when it comes to antimicrobial stewardship. Um, and my experience both spans the UK and Sri Lanka. So I was very much uh, practicing veterinarian in Sri Lanka, as well as in the UK. And I have seen practice in other countries around Asia um, as well. So all that experience I kind of bring to antimicrobial stewardship, and I will try and share with you um, some of the things that I have learned by traveling and by practicing both in Sri Lanka and abroad um, so that um, we can look at some ways, some small steps that we can take in terms of contributing to antimicrobial stewardship in our very own practice, irrespective of what kind of practice that you undertake, farm animal, large animal, um, equine, uh, or um, exotic species, uh, the principles are quite similar. So um, in my talk, what I will share with you is antimicrobial stewardship in practice. So mainly I'll talk about antibiotics, um, which are the main topic in the world that is being discussed, but that doesn't mean it's antimicrobial stewardship is only for antibiotics. It's for antivirals, antifungals, antiparasitics, all the organisms that we uh, treat in our patients. So all the drugs that we use have a have a uh, have a um, a tendency to become resistant and thereby not be active towards those organisms um, in the future. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about things that we can consider before using antibiotics. We all use antibiotics as practitioners um, and what free online resources there are from the UK because I currently live and work in the UK. I thought I will um, share with you some of the resources that are freely available online that uh, wherever you are in the world, you can access and update your knowledge about this field. And I'll talk a little bit about antiparasitics because this is a vast um, a topic to undertake in 45 minutes to an hour. So I'll just briefly share with you one slide about antiparasitics, but there is a lot more information um, out there and I'll signpost you to those resources, which you can um, use and undertake your own um, training um, in the coming months. So, I will start with what the World Health Organization um, defines as um, antimicrobial resistance. And we all know they're the superbugs. So it's not only, like I said, antibiotics, it's antifungals, antivirals, antimalarial medicines, and any, uh, even antihelminthics. Um, everything that we use against uh, parasites and microbial organisms in our patients, they all can develop resistance. And uh, medi medicines become ineffective. And what happens with, when this uh, is, uh, is undertaken is that we have an increased cost in treating our patients because we'll have to use more expensive new antibiotics if they're available and we lose our patients. So uh, our ultimate goal is to heal our patients, but the tools that we use to heal our patients 
will be and not active against what we want to act against, and then we will lose our patients. And that's the sad part of uh, resistance development. So World Health Organization again says it's a global uh, public health crisis or a serious threat. And especially um, it's for, as you all know, um, there are multiple drug resistance TB already, uh, tuberculosis already there out there. And uh, we have immune compromised patients. So with the global pandemic, when we had COVID-19, we saw how many people in the world were um, uh, immune, not immune competent and they had to shield and they had to be protected. And um, not just that, we do so much surgery as veterinarians, we undertake surgery every day, almost every day in our practices. And that that surgery is can be from a hip replacement or a, a, if you are in a developed country, you'll be doing hip surgeries or um, even in uh, the developing countries, we do so much orthopedic surgery and joint related surgery, which you need to have um, ultimate sterility and you do not want an antimicrobial resistant organism infecting your wound, surgical wound. And so it affects us directly, it affects us day to day. And then if we have resistance, then in future, um, we, we will just have to um, euthanize our patients if the antimicrobials that we have don't work. And it takes, I mean, from my, my um, pharmacology background, I can assure you it takes about 20 to 25 years to develop one new drug to go through all the phases of development and approval by um, uh, uh, governing bodies like the FDA. It takes 25 to 30 years to develop a new drug. So what we have at the moment is so precious, which is why we need to be stewards of antimicrobials. So what antimicrobial stewardship means is we as users, prescribers, dispensers, uh, of antimicrobials, we need to be stewards. We need to make sure they don't become resistant due to our actions. So this is a basic slide I put together just to recap. So we all learned about antimicrobial resistance development in our pharmacology lectures. Uh, we know that antimicrobial resistance happens when the microbial organism meets the antibiotic, which is a chemical. So when you expose the organism to the chemical is the only time that they will develop resistance. If you don't expose the organism to the chemical, there is no resistance. That is why when we prescribe or dispense or administer antibiotics, we need to think a few, um, think, think through a few steps before we actually administer it. Um, to see whether there's the need, is it the right or, uh, chemical that we are using? Is it the right patient that we are using it in? Uh, and go through those steps and make sure that you don't prescribe unnecessarily. So according to the research, uh, it has been found that doctors, dentists, and vets over prescribe antibiotics globally not just in any one country, it's global. It's in the developing world, it's in the developed world as well, okay? Um, and there's patients don't comply. So our, our patients cannot speak. We have an intermediary, a client or an owner of our animals. Um, so we need to be able to communicate to the client about administering the antimicrobials that we are giving to them to our patient. So in, when it comes to doctors and dentists, it's the patient itself uh, not complying. In our case, we have another intermediary. We need to get on board in order to make sure that the administration is um, done correctly. Uh, poor hygiene and lack of infection prevention and control is a major reason for uh, prescribing antibiotics. So I will share with you some uh, publications uh, that support what I'm saying. And um, um, I'll talk about it in the next slide for that mainly. And then obviously travel around the world. We know that when we travel, um, everybody looks at our passport, right? Nobody looks at what we are carrying. Um, until recently, nobody looked at uh, uh, what viruses we carried. Luckily now, because of COVID-19, we now uh, get a test done. 
but that's only COVID-19. But how many other organisms we carry? So some people would argue, okay, this is this antimicrobial stewardship is um, too much. We are doing too much. Uh, we used to treat 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We used to, um, you know, do surgeries. We didn't have any problems. Animals got better. Um, we gave all the antimicrobials. But the world has changed now. There are more people on the planet. There are more animals that are pets and production animals because we need more food for to feed more people. And we travel more. Um, we, um, you can be in five different countries within a few hours and nobody will check what organisms you are carrying with you. So this is why we need to think a little bit more about uh, prescribing and dispensing antimicrobials and um, take care to be stewards of these uh, chemicals that we use or medicines that we use. So what is out there measures? This is a good paper if you are able to access it. If you are not, please let Dr. Chamari Kanangara know and I will try and share with you this information. Um, Antimicrobial Stewardship in Veterinary Medicine. This is a good publication that I really like, which looks at all aspects of antimicrobial use in veterinary medicine. Um, uh, don't be disheartened if you're practicing in Sri Lanka. Um, these papers are, yes, done in other countries, but having practiced both in Sri Lanka and the UK, I can assure you animal diseases are the same. Animals come up, break the same bones. They have similar uh, uh, conditions when it comes to treating them. The only difference, I guess, would be that in Sri Lanka, in a tropical country, you would have more diseases like tick fever, um, and you would uh, um, have less of those in countries that are in the temperate region. But apart from that, all the things that you do in Sri Lanka is what I do in the UK as a practitioner. And um, we just probably have a few more you know, gadgets that we use for diagnostics. Uh, but apart from that, practice is practice. Animal diseases are animal diseases wherever you are in the world. And everybody on the planet, all veterinarians on the planet use antimicrobials, antiparasitics, antibiotics, okay? So um, wherever, no matter where you are in the world, you can do, if you can't do all of what is suggested in antimicrobial stewardship, don't worry, if you do a few steps, you can make a huge difference. So reducing the use, replacing it, um, and refining uh, the choice of antimicrobials is important. So I'll talk a little bit about how you actually act on these different, we call three R's. So um, Dr. Susanta just said that it's the environment day. So for environment, we know there's a three R's, uh, recycle, uh, reduce, recycle, and uh, replace uh, when we talk about plastics and stuff like that. So very similarly, antimicrobials, you can use the same principles in antimicrobial stewardship and think about refining your use. Um, so I'll talk a little bit in my subsequent uh, slides. What I'll do is I'll go step by step in the prescribing actions that we take and uh, how we deal with prescribing and talk to you about how we can do stewardship in those steps in practice. So another paper that I really like, this was a, a paper done in the UK. Um, it was uh, uh, among veterinarians practicing in the UK, mostly companion animal veterinary surgeons, so uh, small animal practices, uh, in other words. And what the uh, scientists here looked at was the behavioral drivers of veterinary surgeons' antimicrobial prescribing. So what makes the veterinarian prescribe? So um, we all know when we do surgery, we are really, really scared that we will cause an infection. So um, sometimes we second guess our own steps. We wonder, oh, have I created an infection there? So we like to give preventative antimicrobial. So uh, antimicrobials as, so probably general practice doctors do not use as much antibiotics as we do because we are surgeons. We are not just medical practitioners, we are all surgeons as well as medical practitioners. So in every surgery, if you think about a morning's uh, practice, how many surgeries you undertake uh, or in a day, in a week, um, can you imagine if you didn't think about the infection prevention 
uh, your infection prevention control. So washing your hands, maybe wearing a sterile gloves, disinfecting your surgical table, disinfecting your surgical room, um, disinfecting um, your surgical instruments, um, uh, telling your support staff to uh, minimize contamination of the surgical site, clipping, disinfecting the surgical site. All of these steps, if we are second guessing what we are doing, we always reach for antibiotics as the, um, the cure for um, what we are not sure about. So that's where everybody in the world, this is not just the developing world, this is developed world, everybody, over prescribes uh, around surgery, okay? Cautionally prescribing just in case. Sometimes you think, oh, this is a viral infection, but just in case I'll give a little bit of antibiotics uh, and see what happens, especially with respiratory infections. We know a lot of the upper respiratory infections in animals as well as humans are viral uh, originated. So we don't need to give uh, uh, those antibiotics. Um, what about cat castrations, um, tomcat castrations? We don't have to give an antibiotic um, uh, in castrations if we know that we've maintained sterility during that procedure. If you're doing dentals, um, if it is a young, healthy animal and you're only doing a scale and a polish, there might be a little bit of bleeding around the gums, but we don't have to worry about giving antibiotics because we know that the saliva has an, uh, immunoglobulins. We know that the saliva protects uh, the gums uh, from anti uh, bacterial organisms around the mouth. So we don't actually need to give antibiotics in a procedure like that. Obviously, if you take out a tooth, you do, it, you do an extraction, you need to give an antibiotic. If you suspect that the a circulatory system or the animal comes in with a fever, a septic condition, yes, you obviously give an antibiotic. But if an animal is healthy, the immune system is very well intact, and you are doing a minimal procedure, you don't need to give the antibiotics as long as you know that all the instruments that you have used and your environment is um, clean and responding to perceived client pressure. So this is everywhere in the world. So this is a study in the UK. Please don't worry if we are worried in Sri Lanka about client perception and clients leaving us and going to another practice, it's there everywhere. So um, I'll talk to you later about how to uh, get your clients to agree with what you're deciding on antimicrobials. We'll talk a little bit about client education to keep the clients with you, okay? Prescribing without confirming diagnosis. So this is very important. Um, I guess everybody knows that uh, if we can do a culture sensitivity test, um, it's ideal, but not just in the developing world, here in the UK as well, some clients do not have the money to spend on a, anti um, a, a culture test, okay, and a ABST. So it's there everywhere in the world. If you can convince your client to spend that extra bit of money, uh, it's good and it's recommended. And um, inaccurate determination of dose duration and type of antibiotics. So this comes down to a little bit about pharmacology. Um, going back to our knowledge in our um, undergraduate years where we talked a little bit, uh, we always talk about how to prescribe um, and how to take the doses. And then looking at, uh, as we practice, we also are able to look at the um, clinical texts and see how medicine changes. So keeping in abreast with uh, what is recommended for example, uh, pyodermas um, and uh, uh, chronic skin infections and even respiratory tract infections. Um, when I graduated back in early 2000s, we, we used to say give eight weeks of antibiotics or something like that. But now the current theory is do not prescribe more than two to three weeks of antibiotics without bringing back the client, patient and reassessing, reevaluating and uh, uh, seeing whether the need is still there. Because we, I remember when I first graduated, we used to give like month, month of antibiotic without even getting the client, just sometimes just over the phone, you ask how, how is the patient. But that's 
probably not acceptable anymore, be given that we are in a climate of antimicrobial resistance taking over um, uh, our practice and our medic, uh, minimizing the medications that we can use. So it's always good practice to uh, try and bring your client or patient back and reassess and reevaluate and rethink the antibiotic uh, regime that you have prescribed. So this is what came out of the UK profession. And I believe this is common to us all. It's not just the UK profession. So sources of information. So um, this is a good site to keep an eye out, uh, critically important antimicrobials for human medicine. So this is the sixth revision done in 2019. So uh, round about every two years, World Health Organization uh, renews this uh, website and shares with us uh, globally, what are the critically important antimicrobial organisms. So I put the link to this in my references. You can always keep in, uh, abreast of this information. So this is what the site looks like. They talk about antimicrobials, um, a C1 class uh, is, uh, is the sole or one of the limited available therapies to treat these particular uh, infections in humans. So we live, as I said, we live in one world. We share it with people, we share it with animals, and we exchange microorganisms between us, um, animals, humans, environment. Um, so we are not in isolation. So your patient that you treat will go home and will be interacting with their, uh, with your client or the owner of the animal, uh, will be going for walks in the parks, will be interacting with greater society, will go and do their job in the park. And that means if there's a gut microorganism that is resistant, it's going to go into the environment. Rainwater can carry that into the water bodies. Um, from your clinic environment, if you have a resistant organisms, when you clean, you drain, uh, you send the water down the drain and that drain goes into uh, the local estuaries in your area. So you are spreading the um, antimicrobial resistance organisms everywhere. If you do not change your uniform at work and you get on a bus or a train and you go, um, uh, you touch all the surfaces, you can transfer all that material. Um, or the organisms that are resistant. The pet itself can walk about. So if you think about it, we are not in isolation. We are spreading these organisms if we do not think a little bit and take the infection prevention measures that are required within our practicing environment. So this slide talks about cephalosporins, third, fourth, and fifth generation. I've given you a few examples of the drugs. These are only a few. There's more that you need to think about. This is the current information. This changes every two to three years. So um, I've given you the link that you can keep an eye out for what the World Health Organization research uh, comes up with in future. This is another free access resource uh, 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 provided by the British Veterinary Association. It's called a seven point plan. This is relevant to all species. Um, how to think about antimicrobial resistance development reduction from your uh, practice. So working with your clients to avoid the need for microbials, antimicrobials, avoid inappropriate use. So we were talking about you know, not doing your infection prevention control measures correctly or um, and uh, using it for um, just in case um, use so you can minimize those. Choose the right drug for the right bug. So as much as possible doing culture ABSD if possible. If not, um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can guess the microorganisms by knowing what the infection is. Um, and then monitor antimicrobial sensitivity. So this is more um, on the owners of the governing bodies um, in different countries. So keeping an eye out depending on where uh, you are practicing. So in the UK, it's the uh, uh, VMD, a veterinary medical directive. And in Sri Lanka, I'm sure the DAPH has some information for you. And um, depending on the country, obviously uh, keeping an eye out and also the 
it would be good if organ uh, veterinarians, small animal practice veterinarians, obviously in Sri Lanka can get together and think about a way of monitoring antimicrobial resistance, it, 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 um, working with microbiologists, um, just to make sure that you know what's resistant in your region. So for example, in, um, in the UK, regionally, we have a rough idea of what organisms are resistant. And uh, in Scandinavian country, countries, there's more information where they actually take antimicrobial resistance quite seriously. And they have very good surveillance systems where they take out some of the antimicrobials for a while and uh, advise all medical practitioners, human dentistry, um, veterinarians not to use a particular antibiotics, just to um, keep it away from society. Uh, I think Priya, Priya Saad, your microphone is uh, not muted. Thank you. Um, so um, in those countries, what they do is they, if they see a resistance organism developing in, in their environments or in their regions, they advise the practitioners to stop using an antibiotic for a while, maybe six months. So the, in fact, the pressure for the microorganism. So uh, in my first slide, I told you that if there is no anti uh, antibiotic or the chemical meeting the microbe, there is no resistance development. So if you take the chemical out of anti uh, the, the my, uh, bacterial population in that region completely for five to six months, you stop that resistance organisms thriving and developing. So they do that. They take it out for a few, uh, like a, a year or six months, and then they reintroduce it because after that, the resistant organisms have died off and you can reuse them again. So this is trying to lengthen the period that we can use these chemicals or medicines um, going forward um, and obviously minimize use. And the last but not least thing is record keeping. I think that's where a lot of us um, are weak in keeping records of what, uh, what antimicrobial resistance is out there. So if you can figure out some way of um, making sure that you know what is resistant in your area. So maybe in practices, when you do culture ABST tests, get an idea, keep a record of what was resistant. And if you did get a culture ABST with a very high pathogen uh, 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 antibiotic resistance, I would recommend cleaning your clinical environment as, uh, as much as possible, using the best possible disinfectant that you can use and uh, making sure that MRSAs, MRSPs, all these organisms um, are destroyed in your clinical environment and you don't uh, propagate these organisms through other patients. Another source, again, free, freely available. I've put all the web links on top here. Um, uh, protect, um, this is the BSAVA, that's the British Small Animal Veterinary Association um, a guidance uh, or guidelines for antimicrobial stewardship. Um, so creating your practice policy, reducing prophylaxis, um, and they talk about other, uh, other methods of bacterial reduction. Um, I won't go detail, in detail to all these um, aspects because you can find this information freely online. So you could take a few minutes uh, or an hour um, and go through this uh, information that is available online. And British Equine Veterinary Association, um, which is mainly uh, equine veterinarians, have added uh, two letters to this, monitor and educate. Uh, so it's called Protect Me. Again, uh, all this information is available online freely for you. So go to the BIVA sites, British Equine Veterinary Association site, uh, site. You don't have to be an equine vet. They have wonderful information in terms of um, how practically you could, um, they've got uh, flow charts. I probably have, a, there you are. So if you had to use a protected antimicrobial, how do you think? What is the thinking process behind it? Let's say you've got a microorganism that you cannot uh, uh, get rid of um, using any of the antibiotics of, at your disposal apart from a protected antimicrobial agent. How do you make that decision? How do you go through that thinking process? And this is a lovely chart and all these things are available to you online. So please utilize those resources. 
Okay, so things to consider before prescribing. I talked a little bit about some of these things, but I wanted to put everything down in one slide for you. So confirm the need. And we all know that we use antibiotics in different settings. So we use empirically, we use uh, uh, ident by identifying the bug, or we can do culture and a sensitivity test. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these boxes in my next slides. And we have um, location of the infection, host factors, um, local factors, and client factors. And we select the antibiotic, and then we always think about our pharmacology a little bit, and also this, uh, so that, that means the safety of the antimicrobial for that species and for that uh, infection. How do we dose? How, how long are we going to give it? And is it efficacious in that particular uh, scenario. So this is sort of like in one page, how we should be thinking uh, when we uh, decide on giving an antimicrobial. And in each of these steps, you can put in a, another step of thinking and minimize the use of antimicrobials. It's not rocket science. It's not major using huge equipments. It's just a small step. So I'll talk to you about these steps. So what I meant by empirical antimicrobial therapy was um, unknown organism. So you have an infection and uh, you, you, you can guess the likely pathogen. So if you have a skin abrasion, let's say there's a cut in the skin of an animal and we know the, the most probable organisms that can infect that skin in, in uh, abrasion would be a staphylococcus. Um, if it's a UTI, urinary tract infection, we know E. coli is a high possibility because we know that these organisms can be common cells around these uh, areas. And when there's an abrasion or immune compromise, these um, uh, opportunistic pathogens come in and invade the uh, region. So we can think empirically and we can prescribe. And um, so in this... Um, situation. How can we, if the client doesn't have the money to do a culture BST, and maybe there's a time constraint, um, culture BST might take longer and you want to treat on the day. How do you supplement, increase the likelihood of what you're giving uh, is correct or the me medicine is correct? You could do a, um, um, a smear. You can do a gram stain quite quickly. Um, you can figure out whether it's a gland positive or negative organism. So you can supplement that decision very quickly if, if you don't have the funds to um, uh, spend for uh, an expensive safe test by just taking a smear and, and staining it. Definitive antimicrobial therapy is the next one. Um, so infection organism, you have the funds, the client has the funds, um, you are able to wait for the tests. And in the meantime, you could prescribe something, but you can still get the culture sensitivity test done. So that's the ideal gold standard, I would say. And when you do that, you always try and use a narrow spectrum antibiotic, not a broad spectrum, because you actually know what the organism is and what it is sensitive to. Prophylactic antimicrobial therapy. Um, again, we talked about in that study, it came up that uh, surgery 90% uh, or, or more than 90 minutes um, surgery implants uh, inserted. You can give prophylactic antimicrobial therapy, but think again, if you're doing something that's a short duration surgery, for example, like I said, the cat castrate or a um, dental uh, clean and polish of uh, a teeth of a dog or a cat that doesn't uh, involve any extractions and a very healthy young animal, you don't need to give the animal. Think, be brave, trust your infection prevention protocols and trust the immune system of your patient, okay? So prophylactic antimicrobial therapy in your practice, if you can reduce Step by step, it doesn't have to be overnight. Step by step, if you can think about ways of minimizing or reducing the use prophylactically, that would go a long way in antimicrobial stewardship. So this is, I, I just, everybody knows this, the four quadrants of antimicrobial use, uh, gram positives, negative. So if you did your smear and you stained a gram positive or a negative organism, this is a quick uh, a chart to look at. So have this in your clinic on the wall and uh, you can make a quick decision um, in terms of choosing an antimicrobial agent. 
location. So uh, uh, location of the infection. Now, uh, again, I'm going back to my dentures and cat castrates and short uh, uh, duration surgery where you have made sure your instruments are uh, properly sterilized, your, uh, you have done the correct uh, uh, wash, hand washing and gloving protocols, you've worn your surgical gown, you've worn your masks, and, and you've done everything possible, cleaned your surgical unit, cleaned the surgical table, and disinfected the region of the animal really well. Please trust your uh, instincts and um, do not prescribe if not needed. Um, and think a little bit about uh, the concentration of antibiotic that can reach that site. Um, if uh, we know that there are penetrating uh, issues about uh, the antimicrobial reaching that site, so eye, uh, brain, um, uh, lung epithelium. So um, think about your pharmacology a little bit and uh, medication and where they will be acting. So uh, to minimize giving the irrelevant antibiotic for the place that you are wanting the infection to be uh, reduced or uh, destroyed. Um, and also the microbe, microbial organism that you are trying to um, destroy. Is it inside cells? Is it an intracellular pathogen? Then um, some of the antimicrobials might not work. So please look into the pharmacology of that uh, particular drug that you are using and make sure that it is the right drug that you are using for the right location. A little bit about host factors, um, immune competent patients, bacteriostatic antibiotics are very good. Um, they will act because what bacteriostatic antibiotics do is they um, weaken the bacteria and the immune system of the animal comes and destroys the bacteria. So a good uh, immune competent immune system has to be there when you administer bacteriostatic antibiotics. But when it comes to immunocompromised patients like the pregnant uh, bitch or um, uh, FIV infected cat, think a bit more about giving the bactericidal antibiotics because um, these animals, the immune system is not um, competent enough to destroy a bacteriostatic, um, sorry, a bacteriostatic antibiotic section. So basically you need the antibiotic agent to kill the microorganism. The immune system cannot supplement the killing of the organism. Then obviously you have your geriatric pediatric patients. Geriatric patients, what I like to do in practice is basically get um, an animal that's more than five to six years of age, get them into the clinic at least once a year. So if they come for vaccinations, convince your client to uh, get a full clinical examination done do bloods, do a, a thorough clinical examination, catch infections before they become too, uh, uh, too um, aggressive in the patient. So regular checkups are the best way to uh, be uh, ensure antimicrobial stewardship. And um, recent antibiotics, so another clue as to resistance development is when you keep giving antibiotics, if you've gone from one antibiotic to the second antibiotic to the third antibiotic, you know that you are dealing with a resistant organism in that particular area. So please convince your clients to do your antimicrobial tests, the culture and sensitivity test, and uh, make sure not just the test, make sure that you clean your um, practice environment after that animal has been for treatment because you could be transferring that organism not with just within your practice, all the patients that come in, all the staff that come in and out of your practice, as well as you will be taking it home and you don't want to do that. You don't want to contaminate your home with the antimicrobial resistant organisms that are in your clinical environment, okay? Um, and then we, uh, the larger the bacteria, so the location, so the um, organism, um, all microbial organisms, when you have an infection site, can be either mixed with blood, uh, uh, it could be other tissue fluids, 
and um, there can be significantly um, necrotic areas. So like in this image on the limb of the distal limb of a dog, you have necrotic uh, material, you've got pus, um, you have edema, or so a transudate, exudate, all of these uh, substances hinder, can hinder the, uh, the antibiotic working. So when you, for example, I like to tell my students this, if you have um, a, a cat uh, scratch abscess, let's say cat fight, there was a cat fight and you got an abscess cat coming to your clinic. Um, the first thing that you want to do uh, before thinking about antibiotics should be to lance that, uh, the uh, abscess. Lance, drain it, flush it. And if you are able to put a drain so that it keeps draining out from the uh, abscess, otherwise, no matter how much antibiotics that you administer, if you leave the focus of infection, you will not get healing. And what will happen is there's more and more the fibrous tissue around the capsule of the abscess will start getting thicker and thicker, and you will not be able to get penetration of the antibiotics. So um, the, uh, this is more of a, a problem, I guess, uh, when you have new graduates who have been taught that antimicrobials are uh, so precious that you should not be using it. That's not what antimicrobial stewardship is. Antimicrobial stewardship is using the antibiotic when needed and you not using it when it's not needed. So, um, uh, I was told by some vets that uh, some young veterinarians are so scared to even lance uh, uh, an abscess. They don't want to give the antibiotic. And no, you need to administer an antibiotic. You need to make sure all the debris, the necrotic tissue and everything is got rid of and the antibiotic is administered. Now, if there is no systemic infection, you can stay without giving an antibiotic. If you, are, uh, if you don't have fever in the patient and you do not have uh, um, septicemic signs, you might be able to just drain and clean and use uh, normal saline or iodine and get rid of the local infection and still uh, not use an antibiotic. So gauging what is right at the given time, just having protocols in your clinic. So if you are a clinic with multiple vets, practicing in your premises, um, have a protocol like in the protect um, uh, guidelines. The first thing was protocols. So talk to some of your friends. Uh, if you are practicing alone and you have your own practice, um, if you are competing with others in your region, obviously you probably don't want to talk to them about protocols. But if you have a friend who's practicing in another region, have a little chat. Uh, think about ways that you can have some protocols in your own practice so that you don't over, over prescribe or you don't prescribe in the wrong way. We, once you started practicing for now, I've been graduating. Uh, practicing for 20 years uh, after graduation. So as time goes on, some of the pharmacology knowledge just goes out of the window. Um, uh, so just going back, talking to a colleague and thinking, okay, how, how can I minimize the use of drugs or antimicrobials in my practice? Um, maybe an idea to talk to your friends and think about a few ways that you can contribute to stewardship. And then obviously the client factors, this is such an important part. Um, the dosing schedule, um, uh, compliance, client compliance. So um, think a little bit about your client. So as a veterinarian, as you do your history and your consult, you get an idea about what kind of a household your pet comes from, okay? And if you're in a farm, you will know the farmer, you will know the farm environment, okay? so. Think about the people who are between you and your patient. The patient's drug uh, or the medicine administration completely depends on your client's compliance to what you are saying. So I remember once I told some uh, a client uh, to give uh, two tablets three times a day to a cat. The one thing you want to do, make sure is if you're giving oral medicines like a tablet, make sure that your client is able to administer the drug. So pilling a cat, giving pills to a dog, if you want them to do it, please train them. Um, if you are in Sri Lanka, we don't have vet nurses, um, get your 
um, helpers or the staff that you have helping, I'm sure they'll be very good at peeling cats and dogs, get them to teach the client how to do it. Okay, make sure before they leave the, your practice, they are able somehow to get that medicine in. If you prescribe something that the client cannot administer, you will create antimicrobial resistance because your client is not going to give that medication in the way you told them. So when I told this uh, client to give two tablets three times a day, I didn't know they were going out for work during the day. So that was my mistake. I didn't ask them. Um, so they said, yes, okay, um, I'll do that. Seven days later, they came back. The wound was still uh, oozing. It was worse than uh, before. And I could see from the wound that the patient, uh, the client has not given my patient the correct medication. I asked them again, what did you do exactly? She said, I gave four tablets in the morning before I went to work. And I gave two tablets in the evening. You said give six tablets three times a day, but I go to work, so I couldn't do it. So what she had done was she had increased the dosage in the morning. There was a dip in the blood concentration of the antibiotic. And in the evening, she gave a lower dose. And what happened was there was resistant development. So in that wound, I now have a problem of antimicrobial resistant organism to the drug that I gave. So make sure that if it's a, let's say a family with uh, two or three children who need to go to school, parents are working, try and see whether you, what you are saying is practicable to your client. Can they actually do three doses in the day? Um, are you much better off giving something that's once a day? Uh, or is it uh, something that you want to give like a three to five day regime antibiotic injection to this particular patient because of the practical problems in that family, because it, you have to understand the our clients, um, if they were sick, they could take time off. Sometimes if their pet is sick, they, they can't take time off. So think about those little things. Think about who you are prescribing to and are they able to follow your guidelines? If not, give the antibiotic that is preferable and most uh, compliant uh, base for that particular family. So if they can do twice a day dosing, find an antibiotic for that particular condition that is right for that family and that uh, patient, not just the, uh, the location of the lesion or uh, that particular uh, ailment. Otherwise, get the client compliance to take a few days off work. So if you're doing a surgical procedure, you can ask them, can you, um, you can prepare them. But if it's just an emergency procedure or another ailment, you might not be able to do this. So these little things, having that conversation with the client, understanding the client's environment, where they are coming from, is so important for getting client compliance, as well as educating your clients about antimicrobial resistance. Okay. So a little bit about pharmacology. I won't take too much time on this slide, but um, please, please uh, think about pharmacokinetics or what the body does to the drug, um, pharmacodynamics, what the drug does to the body um, and how it interacts in, in the patient's and, uh, body. Now, the reason why I put this slide is, um, I remember when I used to practice in Sri Lanka, we, um, we sometimes use IV antimicrobials um, destined for IV root or IM root. We dissolve them and we sometimes put them in the body cavity when we do surgery. Um, now, this is a wrong use of an antimicrobial or antibiotic. Please don't do it in future if you can help it because a drug that is made for intravenous um, use is made so that it goes directly to the site. Um, and uh, a drug that is made to be uh, taken by mouth is uh, designed chemically of, uh, and through manufacturing processes to be going into the acidic stomach in a small animal and to be absorbed to the blood, go through the liver, go, undergo the first pass effect or the uh, pharmacological changes and reach the site. So the drug, if it is made for oral, please don't use it in any other form. If it is for IM, it should be given IM 
not dunked into the peritoneum. So this is the reason I put this slide, because if you use it wrong, um, you will create antimicrobial resistance without knowing. Okay, this is a hard one to change, I think, but it's something you might want to slowly think about and change your thinking uh, in terms of how you use antibiotics. If you can see a little bit about the pharmacology, um, um, I just wanted to talk to you about uh, sen sensitivity versus resistance. So minimum inhibition concentration is what we want to achieve. So if, if that patient of mine that gave uh, the two tablets in the night, definitely it wasn't the dose that was required. They had to give two tablets, two tablets, two tablets in morning, midday and night, but they didn't do that, which means the antibiotic concentration in the blood is all over the place and resistance can develop. Um, in order to minimize resistance, you have to have about 60 to 90% of um, the inhibitory concentration in the blood um, of that particular patient and the location of infection. So you don't want those dips in uh, changes in concentration in the blood. Um, and especially with time dependent um, uh, antibiotics like the penicillins, beta lactams, um, and uh, the concentration dependent uh, antibiotics like fluoroquine alone, so you need to think about this. So I think I have a slide later on about those two charts. But, but host, um, so stay safety, uh, thinking about making sure that the client doesn't overdose your patient, and also. Um, doesn't create antimicrobial resistance. That's the balance that you need to achieve with your client um, in terms of your patient. And think a little bit about the renal impairment, hepatic uh, dysfunction. So if a particular antibiotic is metabolized by the liver and you have a liver disease, you obviously would not give it. But if by any chance you gave it, you should know that the blood concentration of that medicine or the chemical is going to be way higher than if it the, if the liver was working normally. And again, same with the renal uh, kidney disease. If you have the antibiotic uh, being excreted by the kidney and there is kidney disease, you need to think about the concentrations of the antibiotics in the blood. Um, and uh, lactating females, this is something we all know as practitioners. So the dosing, again, thinking about taking the weight of the animal, so think about always try and take weight. I know during COVID-19, because people couldn't bring their animals, uh, there was a lot of uh, over the phone prescribing going on. Um, and hopefully with the pandemic uh, settling now, more people will come to your practices and you will be able to take the animal's weight on a given date and prescribe and dispense um, according to the right weight. Um, and also, not using it in the wrong uh, route. So not using IV medications intraperitoneally um, and things like that, that's very important. Um, and also for uh, serious chronic infections, you might sometimes have to increase the doses. So have a look at current texts, current sources of information in terms of different uh, diseases and how to approach uh, use of antimicrobials. Um, and uh, um, a little bit about the concentration dependent and time dependent antibiotics are there in this slide. Um, this is the uh, time dependent killing. So um, we want the concentration of antibiotics to be roughly uh, at a plateau, whereas the concentration dependent, we want a high concentration in order to kill the uh, bacterial organism uh, at the site of infection. So the duration, thinking a little bit about duration, like I said earlier, when I first graduated, we thought we were, you know, recommendation was give long durations of antibiotics, depending on the consider. So if it's a pyoderma, long, long standing pyoderma, what, what would you do? Um, give X number of weeks um, of antibiotics, but the current thinking is um, you should see a response to your antibiotic within two to three days of treatment. Um, and if not, you need to reevaluate and change the antibiotic as necessary. And do not give more than five to seven days of antibiotics if you can help it. Um, get the client back, get the patient back, reevaluate, and make sure that you're not creating antimicrobial resistance. 
and uh, chronic infections, um, four to six weeks or more, uh, you definitely need to do uh, susceptibility testing. Uh, please don't keep giving antimicrobials for months and months uh, without checking what exactly is happening at that location of infection. So coming back, we talked about all of these aspects in this slide and how you can do a little difference in each aspect of, uh, of these uh, little boxes that I have put down in your prescribing, thinking of prescribing antimicrobials and antibiotics. This is um, so a few slides on um, uh, the some of the free access online resources that are available to you. So I was very fortunate enough to be uh, a member of the team who developed this um, uh, online MOOC uh, on antimicrobials to a chip in veterinary practice. Um, this was a collaboration between our university, University of Surrey, um, and all the veterinary uh, uh, faculties in the UK um, at the time. So we did this in 2019, 2020. Um, nearly for more than 5,000 people around the globe has undertaken this course. It's free. It's uh, on a, a platform called Future Learn. And, and I have put the link down here. It's a few weeks of learning. It is uh, for farm animal veterinarians, equine practitioners, small animal practitioners, uh, production animal practitioners, anybody, everybody can go through this course and learn something from it. So um, irrespective of what practice you do, please um, have a look, take a little bit of time, do a CPD on your own um, and learn uh, what is out there. And this um, MOOC is continuously being updated by all the contributors as they find new information. So it's a good source to go to and it's free and online. Um, another, so I said I promised you that I would talk a little bit about antiparasitics. So this is my little bit of a contribution to antiparasitics. This is the British Small Animal Veterinary Association um, document. Again, I've put the link to this on at the end of uh, my uh, presentation in the references. How you would look at antiparasitic um, resistance. I know um, we've got fleas that are resistant to what we use. We've got ticks that are resistant to what we use. How would you you kind of think about handling these things and uh, possibly uh, making sure that you don't create so much resistance that resistance that we run out of the antiparasitics that we have currently. And so in summary, what I want to share from my practice experience, both um, in multiple countries is, um, protocols are very important. If you can sit down with, uh, with your colleagues, um, hopefully you might be practicing with more, uh, not alone, but with someone else, hopefully, and coming up with a few protocols, not many, just baby steps. Um, are you going to disinfect your surgical instruments? Are you going to um, maybe use the sterile gloves, uh, do the hand washing protocol prior to surgery in the correct manner using hibby scrub or um, iodine solution and uh, scrubbing and just cutting your nails um, down uh, when you are in practice, making sure that there's nothing under your nails and scrubbing your nails properly. Um, uh, using sterile drapes, um, are you able to uh, get a few drapes uh, sewn uh, yourself or ask someone to do the drapes and then sterilize those drapes prior to using uh, in surgery? Um, and also maybe um, uh, uh, teaching your support staff how to clean the clinical environment, exploring what disinfectants are out there um, to clean your uh, practice environment, making sure you change your clothes when you go home and you know um, wash it properly so that you're not taking antimicrobial resistant organisms wherever you go. Maybe you for using a, a uniform uh, or a coat over your um, you know day-to-day -day clothes or travel clothes. L small baby steps, they will go a long way. So keep a little diary for yourself, revise and improve step-by-step, step. few things that you undertake on a monthly basis or on a yearly basis, on a daily basis that you're going to improve and you're gonna to stick to that improvement going forward. And client education is one of them. So I talked about 
vets around the world being scared that they will lose their patients if they don't give antibiotics. It's a fear globally. It's a fear everybody has because we are so used to using antibiotics and we've used it for now decades and we are coming to a place where we might not have them going forward. So in light of the fact that we would like to continue practicing, we would like to continue earning money from practice and we would like to continue uh, healing patients, think a little bit about getting your clients on board. So maybe writing a little leaflet about antibiotics, tell them if, if your vet doesn't prescribe you antibiotics, it's not because uh, they are not knowledgeable, but because they want to preserve antibiotics. Just give that message to your clients. Um, our clients, they love our pet, their, their pets. More, to most of them, they are their family. So nobody wants to see their family hurt. To, uh, to, uh, advise them about what adverse reactions antibiotics can give. I mean, antibiotics are not safe. They affect the kidneys, they affect the liver, they affect other organs in the body. And if you give that chemical, you can damage other organs. You are doing a risk um, benefit analysis when you prescribe an antibiotic. So everything doesn't have to be treated by an antibiotic. So you can tell your clients, I'm not giving you this antibiotic because the antibiotic doesn't work on a virus. Your pet has a virus. You just have to wait three to five days for its body to heal. So I am doing a favor to you and your pet by not giving the antibiotic. So client education, getting your clients on board with your decision. If you have regular clients, it's very much easier to do this. And I hope if you've been practicing for a while, you do have regular clients. But it's something like putting a poster in your clinic, maybe giving a little leaflet. And if they, some of them come for puppy classes or something like that, please educate them about uh, how, how uh, ownership. And if uh, a client brings puppies for vaccinations and you want to keep those clients for the rest of that pet's life, give them a leaflet, show them that you care about their patient and that's why you're not prescribing. So you can still hold on to your clients and not be afraid of losing them. Working as a team or working with colleagues and friends, like I mentioned earlier, talking to a friend, a colleague, somebody who graduated with you, practicing far away. If you are a lone practitioner and they are a lone practitioner, have a Skype call or a Zoom call these days. It's easy with technology. Just have a little plan, have a little think, what can we do? Um, and think about working together. But if you are in a practice, lucky enough to be in a practice with more than one veterinarian, you all can work as a team and think about some protocols to come up with. Um, and, come, and please continue updating your knowledge. So I gave you some information today in a year's time that information is going to change and I've given you some links how to update. Please keep updating your knowledge. And if possible, please keep records of the resistant organisms that you see in your practice and share that knowledge around with your uh, uh, groups of friends and um, also keep records of patients so that you know what kind of resistant organisms they've had. And also keeping records will also help you um, enhance your practice, improve your treatment protocols and trust the immune system of your patient. The veterinarian. And that's my last slide. These are my references. And thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen. And Ushani, if you can tell me if there are any questions, I'd like to answer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dinetra, for the for the lot of information that you gave us today. Some of some were like you gave us some avenues to think, which is really good. I think uh, because as practicing veterinarians. Well, um, now it's time for everyone to give up, like ask you questions if you have any. And in the chat, I have one uh, here. Um, so one has asked, uh, Bhagavan has asked, um, we are using two uh, antibiotics, amicacin and amoxicillin, both mm -hmm. IV for power, along with other treatment uh, treatments in the protocol. What is uh, what your opinion on this? Well, amoxicillin and amicacin, two antibiotics. Yeah. So, is this a protocol that Bhagavan is talking about, or 
uh, with other treatment protocol? Can Bhagya, I, is Bhagavan online or just to get uh, a few clarifications? Hello, Bhagavan. Are you Yeah, online? good afternoon. Hello, hello. Um, right. Did you say that you are um, using this is when, when you have a secondary bacterial infection to Parvo? Yes, in Parvo, we are using the regular protocol with uh, IV fluids, anti-emetics and other uh, anti-dairy agents mm -hmm. along with IV salines. And uh, to combat the secondary bacterial uh, invasion, uh, we are using, uh, generally we use one antibiotic. But at times, uh, uh, certain cases uh, demand, they are demanding for uh, two antibiotics, uh, amikacin and uh, am amoxicillin with salbactam. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are getting good results with amikacin and, uh, amikacin and uh, amoxicillin. So, um, have you ever done any uh, antibiotic, uh, um, sorry, um, culture BSTs on this no, patient? In, in field conditions, generally we don't yeah. take that part. Eh? But generally, it's by experience, uh, we are using and we are getting good results with uh, this uh, combination of uh, these two uh, uh, antibiotics. So amoxicillin is quite a broad spec uh, broad uh, spectrum there. So I don't see any problem there. But going forward, um, if you are at all able to, uh, I'm I'm guessing you have more than one case. You've treated more than one case of yes. This. Yeah, so if there is any chance, it would be good for you to have a little look in your, uh, where do you pra practice Bhagavan, if you don't mind? We, I am from Hyderabad, India. Oh, okay, right, okay. So um, what I would recommend is definitely you've got probably like a 10 mile radius of patients around you and um, you probably have some kind of resistance to, uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that amoxicillin was used initially and it didn't work and you added amicacin, is it? Uh, at times, the single will start with one antibiotic, either uh, amicacin or amoxicillin. But uh, uh, say after getting say 10, 15 cases, we are directly straight away going for two antibiotics. Yeah, so you pro probably have a resistance there. Are you at all able to do a culture ABST um, in any one of these patients? No, generally for parvo cases, we don't go for uh, uh, culture test, uh, yeah. like uh, uh, otitis or some other thing, they will straight away go for uh, ABST for otitis. Uh, to identify it, the... I mean, if it's working, it's all right. But I am just thinking that maybe you have a combination there because you probably have a resistant organism growing around there and you might run out of antibiotics in future. Um, so it might be good if you can just do a sample of one. And are you, so uh, which area in India did you say? Sorry. It's from Hyderabad. Hyderabad. South so there India. must be some some place that you could get a test done. Uh, but I think you, you are okay giving that um, at the moment. It's just that you might run out of options if you keep doing this for maybe like a year or two. That's my only worry. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Samanti? Hello, Dr. Samanti is having a question. Um, Dr. Samanti, if you can um, put forward your question to Dr. Dinetra. Can you hear us? Dr. Samanti? Um, till Dr. Samanti uh, gets ready, I have a question in the chat box here. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Chamari who had asked, uh, requested you to explain a little bit about transfer of antimicrobial resistance from farm animals and uh, also from pet animals to humans. Okay, so um, so I'll start with the pet animals. So the pet animals, what, what has been found so far is definitely the surface contamination. Um, so the aspect of, uh, in the clinical practice, so our clinics, um, uh, uh, microbiologists have tested a lot of clinical environments and they have found that certain surfaces in clinics as veterinarians, uh, we touch the animal or an infected site. And sometimes we touch watches, you know, how we try to time the heart rate. 
Um, so some people have watches hanging on their lapel. In most of the developed countries, the nurses, they have a lapel hanging uh, watch, uh, fob watch. Uh, they touch that. Or you sometimes touch the computer. So most practices now have computers or recording uh, ledgers um, or files. Then you touch the pen. Uh, the countertops, the tabletops. So what microbiologists have done is they've gone on these um, clinical environments and taken samples. And what they have found is most of the resistant organisms live in our clinical environment because they have been transferred by patients who have come with resistant organisms. And every time you do not disinfect this uh, region, let's say you don't wash your hands and you touch your next patient, you are transferring antimicrobial resistant organisms to the next patient, which probably doesn't have any antimicrobial resistance uh, organisms on them. And then they take it home to their home environment. And if you can imagine in that home environment, if there is an immune compromised person, let's say someone with HIV or someone who's had a, a kidney transplant or heart disease, you are transferring microorganisms from your patient to the human population around it. Then that's surface contamination. And then obviously utensils. So like I said, if you don't disinfect your equipment, in, sometimes including your stethoscope, just wiping it with a bit of disinfectant prior to uh, using it in another animal, you are transferring uh, antimicrobial resistance organisms. And the other place is surgical instruments. Um, some practices just wash them with soap and water. That's not at all acceptable. They need to be disinfected. Every surgery should start with a, a disinfected, a properly sterilized set of equipment. And you need to discard uh, all the things that were used, uh, contaminated in a surgery, and that should go into uh, disposal or incineration. And you need to start anew. So that's uh, equipment contamination, surface contamination. Third is the people contamination, people and animal, animal to human. So the animal, touching the animal, you touching that animal and transferring it to the uh, another animal or another human being. So there's three ways you can uh, transfer my, uh, antimicrobial resistant organisms. The farm animal practice, very, very similar. There's no difference. Um, the only thing is in farm animal practice, obviously you do less surgical interventions. Um, I mean, you would do cesarean surgeries, you won't do orthopedic surgeries on cows and um, uh, farm animals. So you won't have that kind of contamination and MRSA uh, transfer, uh, but definitely fecal, fecal contamination, uh, resistant organisms like E. coli, salmonella transfer. So uh, making sure that um, anybody who handles the animals wash their hands thoroughly with soap and water, um, uh, even for crypto, uh, <laughs> cryptosporidial infections, all these other organisms, washing with soap and water is the best solution, they say. And also as a veterinarian, when you go into one farm environment and to the next farm environment, making sure that you wash your boots, um, wash your gear properly. And um, if you can wear uh, an overall and then wash between farms or change the coat between farms, and especially the boots, um, we know that boots are made uh, for with grooves so that you don't slip in these environments. That's where most of the dirt gets in, the fecal material get in. So you need to make sure that you thoroughly clean your boots with soap and water. Soap and water is adequate. You do not need disinfectant strong disinfectants, but yes, when you walk into uh, farms, you will definitely, the farmers should have disinfectant for you to walk through, but your equipment, if you wash thoroughly with soap and water and clean it thoroughly, any dirt that is in your boots or in your equipment can carry antimicrobial resistant organisms. So infection prevention hygiene goes a long way in terms of minimizing uh, antimicrobial resistance in farms. So 
teaching the farm owners uh, to train their uh, people who the laborers who help them feed the animals and look after and clean teaching them uh, hygiene sterility is so important and as a veterinarian you can advise the farmers on these uh, put down a few leaf leaflets write them down yourself can hand them to these uh, farmers just like I said in small animal practice keep your clients coming back to you because show them that you care about their patient show them that you care about their farm you will not use your client lose your clients if you do that so yes those are the ways infection prevention is the best way to minimize contamination um thank you dr Nitra. we have several questions popping up again um and dr samanti has a put her um question in the chat box uh, she was asking what's your idea on using ivermectin as a antiparasitic drug on farm animals good question <laughs> it's been used around the world um again resistance can happen swap um keep records um, I mean, I can, uh, the, the best example is equine practice. Ivermectin is used for anti antiparasitic treatment um, in equine species a lot. Um, the best thing to do is keep records and as a veterinarian, uh, change the, uh, the antiparasitic regimes regularly. So um, after six to eight months, changing the antiparasitic medication and keeping a record of what the changes are. So it's always... Um, the microorganism facing the chemical. So if you stop the microorganism facing the chemical for a, for a time period, you can minimize the resistance development and bringing it back later on. And also pass the contamination if it's farm animals. And if it is uh, pets, again, it's the environmental contamination with the parasites. So you could have fleas that are resistant to some of the uh, antiparasitics and that those fleas can uh, live in the environment of the pet. So um, in that uh, last slide I showed you on BSAVA guides on antiparasitics, there are in that PDF document, there are a few steps that you can do to control environmental contamination of resistant parasites. So yes, ivermectin, there's no way out of it. Yes, we need to use it, but then maybe um, spacing them out between uh, treatments would be the best way to minimize um, resistance. I hope that helps. Um, Professor Ruveni had raised her hand. Uh, Professor, are you there? Hello, madam. Yeah, hello. <laughs> We're glad to see you and listen to you. It's great. <laughs> Good to hear from you as well. Yeah. <clears throat> and my question is, now you said a little while ago and in the uh, presentation, you said if we can uh, keep the antibiotic and the bug, keep them separate for a while, we can uh, use them again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are there reports, published reports on that? Because I think even though we keep the drug and the bacteria away, uh, we cannot remove the resistant genes once they are in the environment. Yeah, so um, I don't know whether there are any publications, madam. I think uh, best, um, I can look at it and mm -hmm. let you know. Uh, but I know in Scandinavian countries, they are uh, implementing such regimes at the moment. Uh -huh. um, so, for example, um, I think Sweden might be a country that uh, undertakes Norway, Sweden, where they uh, withhold uh, advice um, uh, all the medical practitioners to withhold the use of a particular drug. Um, for example, I know they have done this for amoxicillin. They have withheld it and then uh, after a while, uh, they have started reusing again. Um, in terms of the genes, resistant genes, I do, um, uh, I agree with you. Um, I am not sure whether they use other disinfectant or other uh, methods of um, cleaning the environment of these resistant organisms and then maybe supplementing it with the uh, cessation of the use of the antibiotic. Maybe they do that, but I'm not 100% sure. Madam. Right. Thank you. Then if you can share a publication, that would be... Really I will I will look into it, yes. Um, we have a microbiologist, um, a good microbiologist here, Professor Lara Gionia, so I'll, I will have a little chat with him and see if I can dig up something. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have... Do we have time for a few more questions, uh, Dr. Chamari? 
Yes. <coughs> yes, okay. yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. Okay, then um, Dr. Tananjan has asked a question on nosocomical infections. Uh, his question is, how many days we have to wait uh, to eradicate a particular nosocomical infection? I mean, the he has he said that it, uh, the surface infection. Um, I didn't understand exactly what you so surface infection is this a skin infection he's talking about um, well he had said that it's about nosocomical infection and then uh, he had also mentioned about surface infection so how long to wait is it yeah yeah whether it's possible i think that's what he means so if uh, i mean if the question is about a pyoderma situation, let's say it's a pyoderma, long stem, uh, deep or surface, uh, usually deep pyodermas are the ones that last long. Um, you do have to treat for a long time. Deep pyodermas, if you look at clinical textbooks, they'll talk about weeks and weeks of antibiotic treatment. That's where I, in my one of my slides, I said, no longer we treat for five, six weeks without looking at the patient. So you treat for two weeks, I would say maximum 14 days. And if you don't get a um, uh, a response to it, you should do a culture sensitivity test. Please don't continue treating um, eight, nine, 10 weeks um, uh, uh, without uh, checking for uh, culture and sensitivity. The other thing is, now let's say the deep pyoderma, for example, Alsatian dogs, they get deep pyodermas um, around the um, uh, lips um, usually. And also you have the breeds that have folds like pugs and uh, bulldogs where they have facial folds that can result in um, quite a lot of uh, infection in between the facial folds. So the, the question is, are you going to keep those facial folds that give you deep pyoderma and uh, facial fold infections continuously, or are you going to do some reconstructive surgery on that region to minimize those folds and the minimize the moisture uh, accumulation and causing of uh, secondary bacterial infections in those regions? So that's where... Uh, uh, the minimization or cleaning of that region. So like an abscess, we lance an abscess and we remove the bacteria and then we give the antibiotic. We know that the infection is gone, but if you have facial folds or um, uh, even other parts of the body folds and the environment is constantly there for moisture accumulation and for pyoderma to reoccur again and again, then you need to think about reconstructive surgery, minimizing that the possibility of getting that infection long term and then think about antibiotic treatment and then hopefully if you do your reconstructive surgery you won't need antibiotics for a long time so it's a surface uh, contamination yes but then look at why it is happening what is the underlying cause primary cause for your secondary bacterial infection to occur there and if you can get rid of the primary cause, your antibiotic regime is going to be uh, less. So always, sec if an animal, so if the animal is a, um, Demodex is a, is a good example, isn't it? Where you get uh, secondary uh, bacterial infections because of demodecosis. Unless you treat the demodecosis or the underlying reason. So uh, the immune compromised status of that animal resulting in demodecosis, resulting in secondary bacterial infection. Unless you identify the primary cause and get rid of the primary cause, you won't get rid of the secondary cause. So antibiotics are only uh, a plaster over a hidden problem. So try and get to the hidden problem remove that hidden problem, and then you won't need to use so much antibiotics. I hope that makes sense. Um, well, we got a couple of more questions. Um, uh, it was, it was Dr. Neem, uh, she had thank you for your wonderful presentation. And her question is that, uh, what type of antiparasitic drugs uh, have you found more resistant against nematodes in dogs? And if, uh, if also, if you have found the development of resistant to rather new antiparasitic molecules, uh, whether whether you have found um, uh, development and uh, development of resistance to new parasitic drugs like uh, pruranas. Yeah, so that's there. Um, sadly, we in the UK we use uh, products like Nexgard, Advocate, all of these. Um, 
anti-parasitics, there is resistance, there, is, uh, there are pets coming to us uh, with resistance. And uh, the only thing we do at the moment is obviously uh, we have the veterinary medical uh, director VMD that you can um, let them know that there is resistance in your region and uh, they do a record and they advise on what can be used um, and then swapping swapping products. That's all that is done in the UK at the moment. Um, I am. I don't think there is such a mechanism in the in Sri Lanka. So you probably are just swapping products as well. But one step that is um, quite good in the UK is uh, we have the ability to let the VMD know of resistance. So almost all the products that we use currently have resistance somewhere. And then it's just a matter of swapping uh, the products. Okay, hope uh, Dr. Neem, uh, I hope I answered. Uh, she, her question also had a part on um, uh, resistance against nematodes in dogs. Uh, whether, uh, whether nematodes, what types of... Yeah, nematodes, um, I have not specifically seen anything um, in practice. Um, it is mostly the fleas and the ticks. Um, that I have found uh, resistance. So nematodes, I haven't had, I haven't seen it. Uh, but having said that, the environments around households in the UK are quite, um, I mean, uh, a lot of people even don't take uh, 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 nematode treatment. So I think the cleanliness or the uh, level of hygiene is quite high in this part of the world. So maybe the nematode resistance is seen less here, but it might be seen more in another part of the world. So I'm not 100% sure. I have not seen nematode resistance. Uh, uh, farm animals are another matter, uh, 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 Ushani. I think uh, uh, a farm <laughs> animal vet might be in a better place play, uh, situation to tell what the resistance are. I'm not very sure about that, but I'm sure there is resistance. Sheep and um, sheep and cattle and uh, horse equine practice probably has nematode resistance. Uh, hope Dr. Neem got the answer to her question. Um, and there's another question from Dr. Bhagavan. Um, uh, he's asking demodex treatment we are using, uh, they are using is uh, endrofloxacin uh, 5 milligram per kg oral for 20 days along with um, ivermectin, 500 milligram per kilogram uh, for 20 days. He's asking whether it's all right or if the, if it is uh, not, then uh, what, are, what are your suggestions on that? Um, for demodex, you use, um, okay, so you are talking about secondary infections due to demodex, I am assuming, um, because uh, tactic, uh, I, is, uh, is tactic available? I'm just wondering, uh, do you, do you still have um, the, because demodex specifically, um, nothing kills demodex apart from the antiparasitic. So I guess ivermectin is what they're talking about. So yes, as yeah. long as you write, use the right antiparasitic and um, you use an antibiotic, if there is a secondary bacterial infection, that's fine. Um, the, the problem is you will want to look at this particular patient, every patient to see why demodex is a problem in them because demodecosis is a, is a problem when there's immune compromise. So as you could treat demodecosis for years without treating the primary cause and you will never get rid of the demodecosis. So if I, I hope I answered this earlier as well because demodecosis is because of immune compromisation. So there has to be some kind of triggering factor. There can be a food allergy in the animal. Um, there can be another environmental allergen that causes the skin to be immune compromised and letting demodecosis take over. And um, yes, you need to kill the demodex, but also you need to look at whether there's an underlying cause for that patient to have a demodecosis. Mm, thank you, Dr. Nirza. The final question uh, for the today's session. Um, Dr. Prakash is asking from Bangalore that uh, whether you think that only veterinarians alone are responsible for AMR. 
No, I don't. I think we are collectively, yeah. we are equally to blame. I wouldn't say we are very low down in the list as opposed to human doctors and dentists and pharmacists, depending on where you are practicing in the world. Um, so some countries, pharmacists uh, have the ability to pre- uh, dispense. Some countries, they don't. Um, but I think we are all equally uh, culpable uh, because we, on a daily basis, we do prescribe. And I know from research, it has it is shown that veterinarians like to think they are less culpable than human uh, doctors and dentists and pharmacists. But, uh, but in reality, we are all uh, very much culpable because on a daily basis, we all use antibiotics. Anybody, and, and, the, and the culpability is slightly higher for us in the sense that we not only prescribe, we, we prescribe, we administer, and we dispense as well. Um, most of the time, human doctors um, in the developed world don't dispense. They just prescribe, uh, and pharmacies do the dispensing. So there's a little bit of a shared responsibility there. But as veterinarians, we administer, dispense, and prescribe. So we, we collectively do quite a lot. So I think we have a big role to play, but I wouldn't say it's bigger than anybody else. It's equal, not less. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Nirinitra, for like um, answering all the questions and uh, for the wonderful informative session that you gave us today. And it has been uh, quite nice uh, to listen to you further about the antimicrobial resistance and to think, uh, let us thinking avenues that we never thought about. So um, thank, uh, we would like to conclude uh, today's session by uh, giving Dr. a- uh, Doctor, uh, sorry to disturb you. Yeah, there's, yes. a, there's a waiting question from uh, uh, hand raised by somebody. Panchal? Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. I, I, I thought it was winding up. Uh, thank you very no, much. No, uh, you can ask the question. Uh, I thank didn't you very much the... for a very informative uh, talk, very interesting <laughs> all through. Uh, uh, my background is uh, dairy. Uh, I think uh, we get a lot of blame for abuse of antibiotics. Uh, over the years, I've seen like uh, uh, compromise uh, of quality for price in this country. So as veterinarians, we know the certain drugs that we have to double or three times the dose to uh, get the, the desired efficacy. Uh, <laughs> would you uh, have, um, can you enlighten us on how the UK authorities give this uh, registration license for certain antibiotics, uh, whether they trust what the papers say what they are, or they have uh, like, you know, special level they go to for uh, sort of uh, registering those drugs. So that is the major case of, uh, I think, uh, uh, responsible for like cross country uh, uh, antibiotic resistance uh, in this country, as I believe. The strength and the quality of the drugs being compromised. Thank you, Panchala, for that question. That's a very good question uh, because um, I'm not a farm animal vet, obviously. So my knowledge is limited in terms of how much, what the specifications are, but I can signpost you to some of the resources that are out there in, in the online, uh, which, you, which might help you. So the first one is that um, uh, uh, antimicrobial stewardship in veterinary practice, that MOOC, online MOOC that I shared, in my presentation, that one has one whole chapter about farm animal practice and how to do stewardship and how to prescribe and uh, what you can do to minimize antimicrobial resistance development. From my experience here, uh, we in the UK, the farmers and the veterinarians have to comply with the withholding periods um, before the animal is slaughtered uh, after giving an antibiotic. Antibiotics are prescribed in the doses that are given in the dosage sheet. So the data sheet, 
um, there is something called the cascade in the UK. So um, any anti, uh, any any medicine before we prescribe it, we go through a thinking process. There is a, uh, it's called the cascade of drug administration. We go through the steps of the cascade. So number one is uh, specific uh, disease for that specific species with the specific drug. So there is data showing that the specific infection in that species can be treated by that particular drug. That's number one. Number two would be a specific uh, condition treated by another drug. So, so depending on how you cross species and using scientific data, you go down the cascade and you prescribe. If you are prescribing uh, out of the cascade, so something like you said, you would give higher dose. If there is data to say that something is active uh, in a higher dose, you are, you are prescribing away from the cascade, then you have to get permission from the client, written permission from the client, that there is a risk, an unknown risk, and that they take the onus of that risk. So if there's an insurance problem or something, then they have that you, you take the client to sign a document. So if there was any prescribing like that, there would have to be a specific agreement between the client and the veterinarian that the client agrees to do that. So I would think that there won't be any um, like mass uh, dosing of animals above the recommended dose. Uh, that would probably go to the VMD. So the vets will have to feed back to the VMD and say, this drug is not working, therefore, what are we going to do? And the VMD will is the authority that registers. So in Sri Lanka, it's the Drug Regulatory Authority, isn't it, if I'm correct, yeah. So mm -hmm. you will be registering the drugs with the manufacturer and you can feed back to the manufacturer what's going on with the drugs. So the VMD will inform the manufacturer and things will be changed. So they won't go on dosing high doses if there is an issue present. So that's my experience of the UK practicing environment. But definitely, Panchala, you would benefit from going through that. Um, there's only one section, probably a week's worth of learning for farm animal veterinarians uh, in stewardship. And uh, the good thing about the MOOC is you can actually ask questions online from the educators. So there'll be farm animal vets who are answering your questions online when you ask a question once you've done the course. So as you go through the chapters on the MOOC, you can ask a question and a farm vet, uh, ex experienced farm veterinarian will be answering your question. So can I, I hope great. that helps. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And the yeah. second question will be, uh, uh, out of uh, the antibiotics uh, uh, in food animals coming into the food chain, uh, there could be pesticides, there could be aflatoxins, there could be uh, microplastics. Uh, what would you think is the worst culprit at the moment uh, in the world concern? Oh, difficult question, good question. Um, I mean, aflatoxins, I guess, would come from the food. Uh, food sources of the um, animal. I think antimicrobials are as, I mean, aflatoxins will cause um, liver failure, non-alcoholic cirrhosis in people. And that, that's a big cause of death among humans. Um, I would say something like uh, aflatoxins, if, we, if it, it is the responsibility of the farmer to store their um, the food for the animals responsibly. Um, but when it comes to antibiotics, it is the veterinarian's responsibility. Um, what antibiotic goes into the an animal, unless the farmer is dosing themselves. Uh, obviously you don't have control over that if that is happening or some LDI is coming and injecting the, the, the animals, uh, then I guess you won't have any control. But if when it comes to antibiotics, I think that's our responsibility. We are the ones administering it. And if the withholding period is not held properly and the animal goes into slaughter and it get in, gets into the uh, food chain, then yes, it is our responsibility and it is very bad because we have a duty of care 
um, to farmers and the population uh, to give them the safe food source that we the safest food source that we can give. So antimicrobial resistance for me in that sense is supreme as a veterinarian. Um, the things that I cannot control, probably they are as bad, obviously, but I don't have control over them, if you get what I'm saying. So I think antimicrobial resistance, organism spreading, as well as antimicrobial residues getting into the food chain, I think as a vet, Yes, I, I, I feel that that's more uh, onus on me than um, something that I can't control. Panchala, does that answer the question? Yeah, it did. It did. Because, uh, because yeah, it's whole, our it thing. It's a whole, holistic thing I asked because everybody blames for antibiotics. Yeah. There are other things like microplastics and everything causes certain issues. It's like, mm. uh, like you know, keeping one apart and just talking about the antibiotics, um, just an open question. I, yeah, I, I it's just uh, what we yeah. can control, isn't it? Yeah. It's basically our, our responsibility is with the drugs we administer and the ailments uh, and also preventing things like TB getting into the food chain through slaughterhouses. Veterinarians do a great job in slaughterhouses, preventing that kind of thing. Zoonotic diseases antibiotics, um, other chemicals that we administer, any of the other uh, you know, medications we give. If it gets into the food chain, yes, it's our responsibility. But the other things, we can't say anything about it, can we? Sure, sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank you very much. Now, no Stevie. problem. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Pinedra. Sorry, Dr. Panchal, I didn't uh, see your hands get raised. Um, okay. So um, hope uh, all they ha all have uh, asked the questions uh, that they had, and guess it's time to conclude the webinar. Very informative webinar today. I think um, it has been uh, very useful um, to all of us. And thank you, Dr. Vinetra, like to taking your time and time to deliver all this information and answer these questions um, for the Sri, Sri Lanka Veterinary Association and all the all who have joined the webinar today. Thank you so much, uh, Ushani, Dr. Susanta, and um, uh, Cham Dr. Chamari, who's always been in touch with me. And I think she's the one who initiated it and said, can you do a yeah. talk? So thank you so much for being in touch. And I uh, very much wish you all the very best and I'm very saddened to see what's happening in the country and I'm I'm good I, I'm sort of encouraged by seeing all of you talking and questioning so I feel much better about uh, my colleagues in Sri Lanka so thank you so much for your time and it was a pleasure yeah uh, thank you uh, Dr. Dinet ah, on behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association as the secretary it's my duty to give the vote of thanks so, uh, Dr. Dinetra, actually, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation. I have just asked you to do a webinar uh, for our vets and without any hesitation and, and also without thinking, you, you said yes. So, it's a very great, great pleasure for us to uh, being here with you, be you being here with us today. And also, uh, the, this antimicrobial resistance, it's a very hot topic uh, in, uh, in this scenario. And not only in Sri Lanka, all over the world. So uh, your presentation, it's very informative and I'm sure all our vets, those who have listened uh, to your presentation today, and also those who are listening to the, your presentation uh, later via our YouTube channel, definitely they will think twice because before uh, administering uh, an antibiotic to an, any animal. So thank you very much, actually with a wonderful uh, pictures and all the information Information. I'm. I. I. I'm sure you must have taken a lot of your time to prepare this presentation. Also, so again, on behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I'm very glad that as a, a, a life member of 
our association, uh, Dr. Dinetra, uh, having you here and thank you again. And next, uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Ushani Athapattu, today's moderator. Thank you, Dr. Ushani. You joined us all the way from Australia. Thank you very much for accepting again our invitation to become the moderator today and also your wonderful work as the moderator. Thank you very much. And next, I would like to thank our president, Dr. Susanta Malavarachi, and all the executive committee members for joining with us today and also for their help. Uh, organizing this webinar series and also I must thank those who have joined uh, today uh, from Sri Lanka, not only from Sri Lanka, from India, Nepal and all other uh, countries. There are a lot of uh, vets uh, joined from uh, other countries today. So thank you very much for joining with us uh, and uh, uh, I hope you will join and uh, listen to our future webinars as well. So our next uh, webinar, we will be having it on this Friday, fifth, uh, seven, uh, next Friday, that is about wildlife. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the webinar will be conducted by uh, Dr. Vijita Pereira. Uh, so uh, I, I'm sure most of you know about Dr. Vijita Pereira. Uh, so I invite all of you to join our next webinar. And also I must, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, actually, I must tell you about our webinar series because this is uh, we have it online uh, and we have it live in our YouTube channel. So those who have missed the webinar today, they can log into our website www.slva.org, our website, or it, it uh, the webinars, all the webinars of previous webinars are available in our Facebook uh, Facebook page. So uh, you can uh, watch it uh, leisurely uh, by jo joining our website. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and again, I must thank all of you and uh, I invite all of you to join our next webinar. Thank you. Hi. Hi, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sugat. Dr. Sugat, can you stop live telecast, please?